Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. In the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool into which there empty these four indrawing seas, which divide the north, and the water rushes round and descends into the earth just as if one were pouring it through a filter funnel. It is four degrees wide on every side of the pole. That is to say, eight degrees altogether, except that right under the pole, there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea. Its circumference is almost 33 French miles, and it is all of magnetic stone. This is Word for word, everything that I copied out of the author, Jacob Ganoyans, years ago. Gerardus Mercator, 1577 letter to John D. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And I thank all of you for taking the time to be with us this evening. I have a special guest with me. Eben Kim. Eben, are you there, brother? Yes, I am. How's it going, Zen? All right, man. Hey, I appreciate you taking the, the time to join us this evening. Eben's got a really interesting story and testimony to share with you this evening. And specifically, he is hoping to make a journey to this area, which has now come to um, you know, as far as world opinion and consideration, a lot of people have been forced to reconsider what may be at the North Pole. And for those that are biblical cosmologists, uh, geocentrists, you know that the North Pole is the only pole as far as the, uh, the flat earthen plane and that it is at the center. And... Um, and so, can you tell us, uh, you know, your fascination with this particular area of study and also share with the community um, your websites, contact information, YouTube, Facebook, anything of that nature? Um, well, I don't have a website yet. I've uh, been meaning to, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, I do live stream. I typically do it two, three times a week, just kind of whatever I've been researching, I just let people know and give my insights onto it. And a lot of it's just watching a lot of videos too. And then, but when I watch the videos, I also like to go to the source of what people are talking about and also go from there. Um, so you can find me uh, easily on YouTube, uh, although YouTube is really stifling down any talk of flat earth. So <laughs> If right. you can't find me there, you can find me on Periscope. Um, you can find me on D Live. You can find me on Steemit, which I go through Vim.tv until DTube is able to live stream. And you can also find me on Restream.me. So there's plenty of places where I put my videos up. Um, I don't do a lot of uploads. I just do live streaming because uh, right now with D Live and going to the blockchain, um, you have to put reside your videos somewhere somewhere else and you link it there but if that gets taken down well you're not going to see it on that blockchain so if you do live then it stays on a blockchain there so um it's a little bit harder for them to talk, take it down but they, they can hide it from people um i mean it just i guess we're trying to find a way where we could communicate with each other and leave messages to each other for because i have not been awake for 
I mean, I thought I was awake two years ago. I wasn't. <laughs> uh, probably my real awakening was maybe two months ago, really, when I finally dived into Flat Earth and realized, okay, most likely than not, it's flat. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, so, yeah, but it, it but it took a lot of videos. And if, I, if those videos weren't there on YouTube, I probably wouldn't have found it because I don't know if a lot of people know how to uh, keep their videos in different places. So I'm just glad that the people who are still making videos on YouTube, that YouTube still has those videos and they haven't taken them down all the way. Yeah, and you are correct that they are cracking down. They are censoring and they are making it much more difficult for individuals like myself uh, that have been making content for a very long time on YouTube. I've been on YouTube since 2007 and have been on the air since 2008 and I've noticed um, especially about three years ago that they changed the algorithms and also as far as the you know the the pay uh, with regard to AdSense and all that that they made it a lot more difficult for individuals to just making truth content and sharing it to, to be able to do it exclusively um, that you know, the, it was a lot easier a few years back, but now it's even getting it tightened more and more, and they're starting to make sure that when people search out terms that they get a lot of what are the disinformation sites, you know, the corporate-controlled uh, mainstream propaganda media outlets and things of that nature. And so... Um, Definitely. Yeah. And it, I think it's... it's well, just okay, really quickly, sorry. I was just going to say that I think it's uh, really important for people to search out, to seek out alternatives to YouTube. And a lot of these, um, you know, the up and coming, the blockchain, uh, the different sites like, um, uh, you know, just different video. Like um, there's one that the YouTube guy um, is involved in now. I forget exactly what it's called. Um, starts with uh, TH. Um, but anyways, so yeah, I think it's good that people search out and seek out different avenues to make their videos available and to, uh, you know, upload their content. So, yeah, it's, it is crazy. I was just uh, thinking about how, uh, when you mentioned all this stuff about when you, when you do try to find more answers, you're just going to be segued into areas that they've already kind of know, they already know that you're going to go looking for answers so they already set up places where you're going to have to go Man, and watch. So you're going to watch, you're going to listen to someone uh, most likely passage, where you don't know their names, you don't know their faces, you just know that they make a lot of videos and you know their voice. And you're going to have a lot of music with what they're saying, scary music, and they're going to pull you back into some type of control system. You know, the, the control system, whether it's government, whether it's money, whether it's organized religion, the one, the things that they control. So um, one of my thoughts that I've been really, really contemplating on making, very similar to Mark Sargent's um, clues videos, Flat Earth Clues, mm -hmm. but it's, it's going to be a video about the, the layers of awakening. Uh, like the process that yeah. I came about of awakening, there's so many layers you have to go through. But what you're going to end up noticing and seeing, and it feels like everyone else who's gone through this awakening process, they go through the same thing. Right. And it's just very eerie that, that everyone goes through the same thing. And um, I, I won't say uh, I, I may not agree with Mark Sargent on everything. I mean, Flat Earth is one of the last conspiracy theories you you kind of dive into but after that you just realize that you you can explore anything because they've hidden everything for you from you you know right right yeah and so much of what we thought to be truth or reality we find out is lies you know just uh steeped upon more and more lies and a lot of just straight up disinformation and you know i i do believe that there's an agenda and i think that a lot of that the whole thing for uh, establishing the Darwinian Copernican heliocentric model uh, is to not only um, lead us into believing we evolved of apes and you know the whole theory of evolution, but 
I think the next aspect of it is that they want to introduce the ancient aliens as our gods and our creators. And we can see that um, coming to the forefront, you know, as far as like ancient aliens, the TV show and the mm-hmm. childhood and different things like that. But uh, so, yeah, let's talk about that, um, the journey to awakening and kind of how it happened for you. Um, did Were you into like, uh, did you study, look into... 9-11 and uh, government-sponsored terror and New World Order and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I was always kind of a conspiracy theorist. I loved the X-Files as a TV show. Um, and I would just kind of, like, I wasn't, I never looked into the conspiracy theories. I just kind of knew it just, I can't really trust the forms of information that I get from government or mm-hmm. the mainstream media. And so I was always like, you know, I, I, they could just make it whatever they want. We won't really know. I'm, I'm, um, I'm agnostic, uh, not an atheist, agnostic. Like I just d- don't know whether we can ever find out, really. Um, and I, people give people lump in agnostics with, with atheists, but I, I disagree. I mean, even Thomas, uh, the apostle, was an agnostic. And so I'm kind of I kind of follow in that boat where, heck, if an agnostic acknowledges something um, from something very spiritual that that they experienced, that that's more power to whatever that experience is, and whether it's Jesus, whether it's uh, the highest of the high God or Lord of something else, you know, whatever it is, if we we go, yeah, it's real. I, I mean. That of course we're still going to say we don't know for sure, but I mean we 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 we're going to be like okay that that was the experience. I'm not going to deny it. Um, mm. So I don't I don't see it as a bad thing, but there is faith in, involved, but it's just it's not a belief. It's just we know we just don't know for sure what it was. <laughs> we just know, but uh, I mean w- the the thing is we keep searching. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you do too. It's, um, it's it's kind of hard because once you fully believe in something that you've got the right answer, you stop looking. You know, once when you when you think you've got the right answer, but you still got that little bit of I don't know, a hundred percent. You keep looking. So that's that's really what it is. We just have to keep looking because once we think we found something, and maybe maybe we did, maybe we 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 found a hundred percent, but we still have that doubt. That's still okay, but if if you probably got it wrong, there's a, like a one percent chance you're wrong, and you are wrong. But at that point, at ninety nine percent, you go, "Oh, I know it is." Then you're gonna stop looking, and you're gonna be, you're gonna know that you're wrong at the end. So I just, you gotta just keep that little bit of skepticism, even if, even if you kind of have a feeling that it's hundred percent, you're hundred percent sure it's, it's true. We're all always learning, you know, the whole thing about life is that there's always stuff to learn and nobody's got it all figured out. And so, um, but I do agree with you that the journey to awakening is similar, that the steps are similar and that even for myself, um, uh, early on, you know, when I first ran away from Christianity and the, the face of my forefathers and the traditions of my elders i moved on to you know atheism and agnosticism and also moved into shamanism and you know things like that and had to really come full circle till i was brought back to to prophecy but uh certainly i think it's similar for everybody even my son went through this kind of similar journey but um once you come to know as far as, you know, like biblical cosmology, and you realize that, yeah, most certainly uh, there is a creator and that this place was established unique as well as that we were established unique. There's no way that life and DNA and uh, the building blocks of life just came about randomly. Everything was designed with intelligence. And so that divine inspiration... um, you can find the fingerprints of God on everything if you really look and come to know that. And and there are things that can be trustworthy as far as 
like prophecy, when you understand that certain texts, certain books of wisdom, certain things, and this is worldwide. It's not in any way just centered on or, you know, focused or centralized on Christianity or Judaism, that uh, there's truth in a lot of things scattered all over. Uh, but we have to also realize that there's another power at work here as well, and that the fallen angels and legion, they have also been working since the very beginning in order to establish uh, pagan and counterfeit theologies, and that you know they are working uh, to promote the dark side and to muddle up the truth of what is connected to the light in the same way that the light is revealing itself and uh, exposing the dark side. And so that's the challenge, is trying to really wade through the disinformation and come to knowledge on what is truth and what isn't. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good thing, though, because when you when you get fed so much information, you just kind of learn to know which one's most likely disinformation, uh, which something else that might be more valid. And it usually has to happen with something that you experienced that you know was real. Um, for me, it was ayahuasca. And um, so whenever something that, I, that I, I'm researching uh, kind of lines up with what I experienced through ayahuasca, it's like, okay, there's, there's a connection here. I'm going to follow it. Otherwise, I, there's really no connection. I just pass it by. I mean, there are things where I've watched videos, I've listened to people before I've taken the ayahuasca experience. And I was like, oh, you know, this is when I thought I was awake, too. And it's like, yeah, I'm not going to follow this this guy, this person. It's just crazy talk. And then <laughs> after the ayahuasca, nothing is by chance. Nothing's really a coincidence. It's all there for you to see. You got to just pay attention to the signs. And, you, and, you, and you, once you see the signs, you're like, I mean, it's it's to me. If I was if I was listening to myself talk, like uh, half a half a like a half a year ago, I would thought, man, I just turned crazy, <laughs> right? And so it's just a weird feeling. But um, but I know I'm I'm doing the right thing. I know I'm going down the right path. Um, I know that um, it's not. I don't want. It's not about ego. It's not about fulfilling my potential it uh, you, the thing is you have to be humble um you have to really know why you're here what you're here to do and if you don't do that well why even bother just go and keep doing what you're doing before you're awake of course it's hard to do that once you once you wake up it's hard to go back to sleep mm -hmm. um i don't know i don't know how anyone could do it Anyone who could wake up and go, you know, I'm just going to go back to sleep. I'm just going to work my nine to five, you know, save up for retirement, do, you know, go vote, go take vacations, whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. that's, I don't know how, but what makes it tough is like, I also don't know how to survive in this new type of system that we want to move into, you know? Well, let me, uh, let me ask you about your experience and where was it and how was it that um, you were introduced to ayahuasca and why it was that you sought it out and um, wanted to have the experience? So um, I, I don't know how exactly. I was just watching videos and I was just still dubious about it because I, I don't really take mind-altering types of drugs or, or things like that. Um. I mean, it, it, like, I don't even do it for um, recreation. It's just, I prefer be to be very focused on just knowing things, learning things, mm -hmm. and messing with stuff, and just building things, being creative. And um, I feel like, like I've taken uh, pot before, and I didn't like the experience. The experience was weird, but I didn't like... The experience. I didn't like the after experience. It's just like when you're getting drunk. It's like I don't really like getting drunk, and I also don't like the hangover. So why would I do it? Yeah. Um, but for the ayahuasca, they say the the experience is the same. Like um, if you, once you take it, 
you're going to experience something that everyone experiences. And I didn't want too much details because I wanted, I want to know what that experience that everyone experiences. Right. So I was like, okay, so how do I get it? It's illegal in the United States. I'm not going to tell people where I took it or when, or like how I took it. People will know when I took it, but, um, you know, I don't want to incriminate myself. I'll plead the yeah. fifth anyway. So yeah, well, let me, let me just ask you this. Um, did, so you didn't get it from anybody or you did, did you do it alone? Did yes, you do uh, it as part of a ritual? I mean, how, how was it that you, um, so I, experience? I brewed it myself. I did it alone mm -hmm. and it was at night. Um, I did most of the suggestions is you, you know, that, that, um, rice and water experiment where they put, uh, rice and water three, there's three jars. One's a control and one jar with rice you put in one cabinet and you just think negative thoughts and harmful thoughts and things like that. And then you, on another jar, um, you, pour love into it and happiness and things like that. And after a week, two weeks, three weeks, you can see the control and the difference between the, the stuff that you would put your, your bad thoughts into your negative mm -hmm. thoughts. And that one gets really moldy and looks pretty bad. But the one where you put pour your happy thoughts and your, your, your just positive thoughts towards that rice water experiment, that, that jar looks like, it was just poured in yesterday, you know? Mm, and that so is, uh, that's very interesting. Can you elaborate on that experience? I mean, that experiment, because I've never heard of that, but I oh. do know, like, um, you know, in that movie, What the Bleep, that your thoughts and your intentions uh, that plants, you know, also feel, and that the water, the vibration on a microscopic level, that it will. Um, in, in you know with beautiful and loving thoughts there's really sacred geometrical patterns and stuff and they'll if you send thoughts of like hate or you know uh, antagonism or anything like that that there's really scattered and disruptive uh, and those kind of patterns so i kind of get the gist of what you're talking about but if you would uh, elaborate on the experiment that you're talking about okay so i'm just pulling up uh, something from uh, csi uh, CSIOP.org uh, by Carrie Poppy. Um, basically, um, Dr. Masaru, Masaru Emoto, he's a Japanese scientist. He, uh, he simply turns normal rice into gross rice simply by yelling at it. And so what people did was they saw this experiment and they go, hey, I want to do it because it's pretty simple. I get his three jars. You have your control, which, you know, it, all the jars, you just pour all the water, same water all at once, same same rice, same jars, same cleanliness. You're trying to make everything as equal as possible, Similar, right? Yeah. Right. So you've got you got one jar that's a control. You put it in the same cabinet um, as the rest. So hopefully that when you take it out, it's um, it's not sunny outside. It's going to have the same ambient light, whatever. You just want to just create a very neutral environment. So... All that they, all that you'll you'll pour into is just your thoughts and emotions. So he puts three three separate jars into three separate uh, cabinet areas, closes it, and I think um, either a few minutes a day or a couple times a day. Um, you'd have to look at the experiment and the 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 positive thoughts, the the water and the rice look like they, there's no mold. There's really nothing bad about it just by visually looking at it uh -huh. and then um the control you've got just your typical growth your you know a little bit of mold you know yeah. you can see the water turning brownish and murky murky but then when you open the one uh with the negative thoughts and energy that that you poured into it that thing looks disgusting it's like um like almost 10 times worse than the control it just looks like someone threw it in the garbage took it out of the garbage mixed in with other garbage and put it back in a jar is just it's just disgusting and that that was just that kind of mm, you know made me just how long um you could do it for months some people just they repeat the experiment yeah. they they'll do it for a week or two and they'll see the results some people do it for like one month two months even six months just to see how long uh, the the good positive water jar yeah. looks yeah and so that made me That's think, cool. 
Yeah. Just how, how our how our thoughts go out. Um, it things get affected by it, and so right. I try not to bring that negative energy to my family, especially my kids. So I'm just doing really my hardest, and it gets really easy to do. Just stay positive all the time, mm -hmm. and just think happy thoughts. Don't really be because you know, when you get depressed or something like that and angry, you're just gonna mull over it. Just try to find a way to snap out of that, yeah. and, and things start. And then it gets really harder to get into that mindset, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it. And I think if if everyone did the same thing, you know, we'd all, we'd all be at a better place, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a, a remarkable experience, um, an experiment because I learned a long time ago, um, just in the things that I was involved in, that really, uh, church is not somewhere you go. And prayer is not something that you do, but it's a it's a way of being. And that if you can learn to really um, focus your thought in positivity, that what you send out into the world is what will, you know, as the Bible says, you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing of Dharma and Karma is very much real. The energetic energetic and the laws of attraction magnetism, the electromagnetic universe, that's really how God has established the creation and the inner workings of it so that, you know, what we choose to place our focus on, how we are, how we act, our behaviors, our intent, those kind of things really do manifest our lessons in reality and the kind of things that we attract to ourselves. And that's why it's really important, in my opinion, to select wisely the people and the circumstances and the habitual routines that you choose to involve yourself in. And that, um, you know, if you have very negative people in your life, it's going to affect you in the reality and the lessons that you have to deal with. But if you put and choose to put and only allow very positive and creative and beautiful people, harmonious into your life that are also uh, very careful with their uh, creative abilities and what they choose to attract and what they choose to put out. Well, those are the kind of people that are really creating miracle and um, really creating beautiful realities. And those are the kind of people that I like to be around and choose to be around. And, um, you know, I try to teach others about their responsibility in the creative process. Because a lot of people don't understand these kind of, uh, you know, as far as the laws of attraction, they don't understand their responsibility in creating their own reality. And a lot of them, because they don't understand these things and have never done like the experiment that you've talked about, they don't understand that their insanity and their depression and their just being angry at the world is why they keep attracting negativity and having a uh, lesson uh, over time and every day they keep having the routine of having to learn you know why it is you don't want to be that way but the lesson escapes them because they don't put the connections to, well, I'm responsible for creating that, you know, and so not understanding that people create really negative outcomes, negative situations out of ignorance. And so, you know, that's why I do think it's important for, uh, for people to come to understanding on these kind of concepts, which a lot of people would say that they're new age, but in truth, they're biblical, and they're exactly how the uh, the Most High established the the creation is with these laws of attraction and magnetism and and energy and things of that nature. Yeah, and I agree. It's the the new some of the New Age stuff is actually old age, and yeah. the New Age paired it out by whatever control system. It's just the uh, something different 
that disregards everything in the past. <laughs> so it disregards the old age and comes up with something totally different, which is it can just be mumbo jumbo or it could just be something where, you know, everything's hidden. Maybe it's just secretly bad for people because they're going to something they have no idea. It could be some form of Kabbalistic magic or something like that. And so it, it's it's hard. I, I feel like I, I don't want to dive into the new age. I want to find stuff that's really old because what's amazing is the more stuff you look back at, towards history, the more amazing things are because you realize that what we've been told all this time is that we've always been separated and um, there's there's no way that um, one civilization could have visited another civilization. But what we find is that all these old ancient civilizations, they've known about other civilizations around their time period. They were so, all connected. Yeah, they're all connected. And so there's one big, uh, very diverse civilizations uh, thousands of years ago. And of course, um, what our, our controllers are saying is, you know, they're just using like copper at that time. They, they, <laughs> they, they, they couldn't communicate with each other. They couldn't sail to around the world. Of course, we know it's not around and all this other stuff. So, um, but, but we know this cause we've, we've been through the layers of, of disinformation and we're just, what's yeah. great about, yeah. Yeah. what's great about the people who are awakening. We don't segregate ourselves into like a, a cult personality. We don't focus on our egos because all the elites, no normal person, ordinary person is going to go ahead and talk or have an interview with them. Like if you went um, to go and talk with, say, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I don't think that would ever happen if he tried for like decades. You know, same with me. But someone like you, I was able to email you, email me back. And I'm like. Awesome. I'm gonna <laughs> I can talk with Zen and Zen's done so much work on what I wanna wanna focus on. And you're just how, like how great can that be? Yet all this time, the controllers of the systems that we have, they've segregated us where you can't act have their access unless you do something for them or something like that. And I don't even know how that goes. Um so it's great that we were all able to just share our time with each other because one person, no matter how, I mean, we can't, we don't live that long anyway, but one person can't know everything. Right. Everyone knows different things, have, have different stories to relate. I'm surprised you didn't know about the, the, the water and rice experiment, but I'm glad you know now. Uh, but that's something uh, new you can carry on and have a discussion with. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know I'm going to learn a couple of things where, I didn't know before at all because I already know I've, I've learned a lot from you from watching your videos and your interviews with other people. So mm -hmm. it's it's almost like I just have to clear up some some things and, you know, ask questions where because who knows if your your thoughts or opinions changed since those interviews that might have been two or three years ago. Right, so right, it's yeah. it's good to just kind of re ask those questions of. Is it is it the same answer as, as two three years ago? Because two three years ago, so many things changed. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's only been since 2015 that I even came to knowledge on as far as the the biblical cosmology, you know, and that that the Earth is flat. And so, yeah, there's a lot of evolution in my thought and in the interviews that I've done, and um, I've you know, continued to learn and grow as we all have. Um, but certainly because I have been on the air since 2008, uh, there's a lot of material and a lot of people that especially have been following me for a very long time have seen how I've grown and changed and come to knowledge on a lot of different things. And, and so, yeah, you know, we're all constantly growing and learning and and as you said, nobody can focus on all the different areas. And what my um, forte and my interest has been is the study of ancient manuscripts. And so that's really where my focus has been. And so I don't 
really spend a lot of time reading others' work or other people's opinion, but I only focus on studying the very ancient manuscripts and the mythologies and the wisdom texts from all, you know, all over the world. And so that dominates my time. And because I choose to focus on that, I've learned a lot of things with regard to uh, the prior times and uh, the ancient cultures and civilizations and how the ancient mythologies and oral traditions tie together with the uh, the prophetic timeline and the you know the conspiratorial side of what's going on in the world. And because of that, I've really been able to unify the the puzzle of truth, which for a, a lot of people that understanding the bigger picture has eluded them because most people are narrow minded and only study a, a small portion of what is available. Uh, with regard to, you know, the knowledge and the ancient wisdom. And, and you know, most people don't even read their Bible, so they don't even understand that side of it. And so uh, there's a lot of information out there, and this is definitely the time, I believe, that the Most High is pouring out the Spirit upon all flesh. And so individuals like yourself and myself and others that have been you know, going down the different rabbit holes and examining things and coming to new understanding, especially on the ancient uh, times and the antediluvian age and the, you know, like as far as Atlantis and all of those mythologies that really they were very much wiser and more knowledgeable and had greater technologies than we do now. And this is something that you know, has been hidden from uh, most people. And as far as the mainstream opinion, the majority opinion, um, all of that is skewed. We think that, you know, those people were primitive when they, the fallen angels being here, they were able to create megalithic structures and cyclopean sites and temple complexes aligned to the stars, which we can't even replicate now, you know, so... Who are yeah. we to say that they were primitive, you know? Yeah. It's uh, it's funny because everything gets reversed, inversed, and <laughs> and and just um, – we see that time and time again. That's just another layer of the awakening. We see that happening. And, yeah, I'm not surprised. Uh, almost nothing surprises me. Like when, when it was flat earth, when I find out that, okay, it's flat – it's that most likely it's flat earth and I was – Unlike most people who go through it, I was just like, makes sense. <laughs> right? uh, and I was like, yeah. yeah, all of this makes sense. Why, why would they fake everything? Why would they lie? And all this other stuff is like, okay, it makes sense. But some people kind of go down to different ideas. Like, it, they lie because they want to control us. But I feel like, well, they could do that with it being a flat earth. So what exactly is it with being it being a flat earth that makes it where they need it to be a globe earth. And that's where I started focusing on the magnetic North pole, not the geographic North pole, not the South pole, the magnetic North pole. And, um, the interesting thing is when you, when you start going into flat earth, they take you to Antarctica. Like most of the focus right. is on Antarctica. Let's like, if it's a dome, we're going to find the edge of the dome and we're going to see what's out there. There's, they, you know, we've got um, the uh, Admiral Byrd saying that there's a territory as large as as America, the United States, out there that we haven't explored. And so a lot of people are going to want to go and explore Antarctica because there's a, a peace treaty in Antarctica. And they're like, there's got to be something there if they've got a peace treaty of all these nations. Right. But the thing is, Magnetic North Pole, they just say, hey, it's nothing there. It's just balls, balls of ice, uh, snow, uh, glaciers, whatever. Yet there's a vast difference between the the Antarctica, or, or just the southward boundaries, and um, and the Arctic Circle, because it's almost a a dead zone down down in the in the southern areas in Antarctica, right? right? But in the Arctic region, it's 
there's so much life there. A lot of animals. Like there's just a almost at least a year of where there's a huge herring population, and all these types of mammals go and feed off the herring. I mean, why would there be so many animals going to the Arctic? And you've got the Arctic. I mean, uh, turns. You've got so many migrations with uh, just animals that go to the Arctic. And if it's nothing there, just ice and cold, then why would they go there? It makes no sense. They would use those migrations to go somewhere like in Hawaii or some tropical right. paradise. But no, it's the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, studying and looking at, you know, even the ancient maps, Mercator, and the things that he cites there, um, like even with what I had read about, you know, this four quadrants that, in my opinion, lines up with exactly what is described as Eden. And then reading the ancient mythologies like Hyperborea, uh, the mythologies of Shambhala, Asgard, Thule, Atlantis even, and even a Paradise and saying the stories of what in the Bible is referenced as the Mount of the Congregation and the sides of the North. All of these things led me to the study of the North. And so even that word, um, the Hebrew word for North, Safalon, it means hidden place, treasured, and, um, you know, uh, kept secret. The These kind of connotations are associated to the north. And so um, I also learned that, you know, basically that the north has the entrance way for where Jacob's ladder is and that um, there's the place to enter into paradise and also into Sheol. And so all of these different ancient mythologies and even with the, the description of the magnetic mountain, the, you know, the black lodestone mountain, Rupus Negra, and then the the whirlpool, the swirling whirlpool, the abysmal chasm surrounding it, um, that it leads into the hollow of the earth. And and then looking into the mythologies of like Odysseus and Jason and the Argonauts and the Aeneid uh, by Virgil, it talks about, you know, this, what is supposed to be this ancient sea monster called the Charbatus, and that it was this... Um, basically a whirlpool that is talked about in the ancient mythologies. And so I came to understand that all of these things were speaking about the same thing with regard to the North Pole as the center of the earth and plane. And so, you know, that's when I decided to write my book on all that, on paradise, the sides of the North and the Mount of the congregation. But yeah, the North fascinated me as well. And, I wanted to know more about it and studying the, the Hyperboreans and the ancient traditions that speak about the, the demigods as living up in that area and that uh, the seed of humanity even started there. So can mm -hmm. you talk about your explorations and your, uh, the <clears throat> things that you've come to know and learn about the North and why it was that uh, it interests you? And, and also, um, you know, before we go into that, can you, also talk about your journey just to awakening. What was it that led you to uh, interest in conspiracy theories? Like, was it 9-11? Because I know that's the, you know, main catalyst for most people. But, and then we can go into, you, you know, as far as the cosmology and your study and your interest on that and how it is that you came to knowledge that the Earth is truly flat. Sure. Um, and just before I go on, I was playing with Gematria stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I, I got started on just kind of looking to septenary because of Maddie Leeds. And um, if if you if you type in hidden land and North Pole, the septenary is 33. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, what's what's interesting is if you type in Yggdrasil, um, the, the 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 Norse tree of life, uh, and oh, yeah. hidden land. Um, the full reduction are both 48, and the reverse full reduction are both 51. So they're identical in that aspect. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so the, I, I, the, all I'm looking at with the gematria is just 
because uh, I could type in a whole bunch of words and, you know, sometimes they don't match, but I just try to look at any pattern where two of either the English or English ordinal, the reverse ordinal or the full reduction, reverse full reduction or the septenary match. And then I just kind of take it from there as like, hey, that's that's kind of interesting. Is that is that there for a reason or is that just uh, a coincidence? That's just something at least to, to keep in mind, but not necessarily just throw away. I mean, it just it has nothing tangible for me at the moment. But if something else comes up and you know in my studies and I type that word in and it matches with some something with the gematria, then I'm like, huh, that this is getting really, really um interesting, I guess. Scary in a way too, because I mean so many coincidences just kind of it, it gets it gets really uh, weird, but um. Anyways, so yeah, um, I was in the U.S. Navy, and um, during 9/11, is it, weird. I was the, uh, I was on the USS Carl Vinson. We're on our Westpac. We're going over to, the, um, um, uh, what am I thinking? Iraq, and this was before the Iraqi War, and you know, still carrying on what um. Bill Clinton was doing within Iraq, and um, I was at that point with a lot of studying and looking through. Is I, I was a conscientious objector. I just couldn't bomb people I didn't know for uh -huh. reasons the military won't say, right. <laughs> right? And I was like, you know what? I, I, I really like the military because the people I met, my experience with the, being in the U.S. Navy was probably the best life experience I've had. Just I learned so much from it. Just what year? The, what year were you in? I was uh, in 1999. Okay. And um, I was just, I was just like, I is because that's a place where you can excel, right? You just know your potential, what you're capable of doing, and they allow that. And then, and then with the realization of, you know, do I really want to kill, like, like first. Um, during a school after boot camp, me and a friend, we were very just gung ho at that point. It's like, you know, our our physical shape, we we can we can be in the navy, uh, or the the seals. Should we be become seals? And we we're just talking about all the time. It's like, what if they tell us to kill like women and children? Would you do it? And he goes, Oh no, I, I can't do that. It's like, yeah, I can't do that either. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so yeah. That, that was like the first step is like, OK, so we're not going to join the SEALs. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. And then it, <laughs> and then it dawns on me is like, OK, you know, being like being in on a ship to defend the country. I think that's a worthy thing. But when you're going in and attacking uh, other countries and uh, like currently the pol political uh, reasoning for it is oil. Right. It's like, yeah. I don't. I don't want to. Even if I'm just sitting in that. And here's the thing: when you're in an uh, aircraft carrier, you're pretty much sitting back in the operations uh, area and waiting as the aircraft are launching, sending God knows what to destroy uh, people's livelihoods and their yeah. lives. And you're comfortable. You get. You get food food you get sal stable salary you get roof over your head i mean it's just a comfortable but you need to obey orders and um it's like i couldn't do that uh but the thing is to be a conscientious objector you have to fall in the in the military you have to follow a religion if you're an agnostic or non-religious they don't say you're a conscientious objector so anyone <laughs> Uh, who's ever in the military or thinks about joining and, and files conscientious, conscientious objector status, they won't validate that unless you are, uh, you, unless you pick a religion. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was just something interesting to, to throw in there. So during 9-11 when that happened, it was on our TV screens, on the ship, and um, just something didn't feel right. At that point, you know, because I was waiting on... Um, a replacement to arrive, someone who will replace me on the ship. Cause I told them months and months in advance that I'm not going to, I'm going to disobey orders when it kind of comes when we're going to go bombing. And so all this practice stuff, you know, I, I, I'll the training for the pilots and other people is like, yeah, I'll help, but I'm not going to take part in it. And so they knew that. And it was a two man team. Usually you have a three man team with eight hour shifts. We each had 12 hour shifts. So if I left, 
my the other guy would have 24 hour shift and even during the times of operation if if um if if they're during ops flight ops and stuff if if he had to fix something or i had to fix something we automatically have to have someone else there the other technician so that i have to be w- woken up or he'd have to be woken up so sometimes we have more than 12 hour shifts so spend all this time waiting and you know 9-11 happened and said okay it's it's time i'm gonna be disobeying orders <laughs> that's all i said and they go <laughs> and, and and the petty officer uh, you know w- w- just knew my situation he's like i know um i'm gonna and then so he went to go get the lieutenant and the lieutenant goes uh, told the chief to give me an order, and it was just a simple order. And then chief told me, gave me an order, and I said no. <laughs> and so, you know, it was a very weird situation. Uh, but yeah. it was great. I loved the people, uh, you know, in my division. It was great. But that was kind of my – the start of my journey is like 9-11, whether it was real or not, I couldn't participate in just carpet bombing some country just on a hunch – um, right. and and so fast forward many years later you know when the internet starts to take off you know I, I do like to browse forums and and just odd things and I come across things like 9-11 was, was fake and or a psyop or inside it was an inside job, job. yeah mm-hmm. exactly and, uh, and I just keep it in my mind it's like yeah maybe but you know we, we'll never find out the truth and it's it's hard to find out the truth. All it is is just a bunch of misdirections and just oddities. And you're gonna. F- and then the thing, the weird thing is, is with with every big organized attack that hits U.S. soil or some something like that, um, or a whole bunch of of deaths. There, when you really look into it, and this is with everything, anything, anything with conspiracy theory. There's just weird oddities and flaws, and the official story never adds up, and they don't expect people to go and really look into it. They expect people to to see it, hear it, and if anyone disagrees with it, they're called crazies, uh, you know. But I don't know what it is, but I just kept looking into it, and I was like, okay, this all makes sense. It's it's most likely an inside job. Uh, either that or you have to just say that the the government or the military is incompetent and so incompetent that they they let this happen yet right. we're gonna give them more control we're gonna let them um uh, yeah, violate the constitution of the United States you know right. they're that incompetent we need to get them more money and more control that doesn't make yeah, sense more power yeah so on, on that end it's like um it's just there's a more those are reasons to have those attacks right if mm-hmm. if they can get more money more people paying money into it more people giving up their rights they'll keep doing it and yeah. so i feel, feel like well if they're gonna keep doing it and they can make up where they want with media make up whatever legislation they want with government what's gonna stop them no one's gonna stop them yeah, and exactly. so it, it's just it was just a really slow p- path towards like I didn't. I didn't make videos at that time. I just did my own research. Hey, and hold different... on, brother. Okay. Hold on, we're at break. Okay. We'll be right back, everyone, for second hour. Wow, it's been an hour already. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> back everybody for a second hour i'm your host zen garcia this is momentary zen here on revolution radio 
And I have a special guest with me, Iban Kim. Iban, you there, brother? Yes, I am. All right. Well, let me turn it back over to you and give you a chance to finish up uh, your testimony in as far as your journey to awakening. Uh, we're, you know, we'll take a transition into flat earth whenever. Uh, but, you know, we've got time. So take your time in covering the story and. And then uh, we'll, we'll follow it up with uh, how it is and why it is that you believe the earth is flat. Okay. Um, so to make everything short, um, <clears throat> I, I would just focus on two things that, that I have to other people that I, I need to keep doing. One is surpass expectations. Um, People will have expectations of you, and it's usually going to be very low. You can surpass those easily. The expectation that matters is your own expectation. And to actually surpass the expectations of even your own self is to get past your comfort level, get past your comfort zone, get out of that comfort zone. Every once in a while, you don't have to do it all the time. Just just get out of it every once in a while. Um, and also, uh, my favorite is from a movie, Gattaca, is you don't, save anything for the return trip don't hold, don't go 50 percent at something and saying if it doesn't work well you know um i have i have this, something else because you're never going to get to the next level you're going to be play it too safe you're going to you're you're not going to be fully invested into it in, in accomplishing those goals for example um when i was in like uh, redmond washington seattle washington that's where i, I used to live and I got a job at Microsoft, play testing games, except they just needed a fourth person. I was pretty good at video games, but I wasn't like playing professionally. Uh, the team that I had and I was playing with is they were like the first, second, third best of the world, right? And I've uh -huh. beaten them, beaten them plenty of times. Even the like the best player in the world at that time took over uh, some, uh, you know, and I have so many stories of this. We put money on it and I beat them twice easily. And like the best Korean player in the world um, would play, and I'd, I'd beat him at, at, at the game. And um, best Japanese player in a tournament, no one played longer than 15 minutes because he was so good, he just beat everyone. And then I played him and I beat him. But that wasn't because I, I was necessarily good. It was just that I, I just knew the, the game. I just knew, you know, it's more – knowing something is almost better than being excelling at it because if people don't know – a certain aspect of it, you can take advantage of it. You know, you can, um, you can, um, I don't know what that term is right now, but you just, it's just a really easy to take advantage of someone, no matter how good they are, by just knowing something they don't know about whatever it is that you're doing um, or the system, the game, whatever it is. Now, um, and then, uh, I, no, I, I, the most I ever made was $19.5. I only have a high school diploma. I don't, I went to college pretty much dropped out. I just didn't care for it. I had depression and this whole other story. So I moved to Boston in 2008. I had, uh, I had an outing with my brother. Uh, it was just my mother support me. Uh, I only had $500 in my pocket, nothing else. Moved to Boston, Massachusetts. Had no job lined up. $500, just a backpack full of clothes. And at the end of 10 years, I was married, had a kid, was making around one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, salary. You know, add up everything, and now that's now we're moved back to like Columbus, Nebraska, where I am now. I make no money. I don't have a job. I haven't figured. I'm still living off of what I saved up, and I've got to figure out things. And I kind of have an idea, but you know, I'm still at this point where I'm learning, and you know, there's things to accomplish. But I don't want to go back just doing what I was doing. I just have to go and focus on what I want to do now, but figure a way where I could just keep going. And so uh, if you just focus on it, get out of your comfort zone. I mean, I don't tell anyone go uh, with just $500 knowing no one where, uh, at where you're going and, you know, being able to do all that stuff. It could have been luck, but who knows, right? Uh, but you just have to focus on it and, and do things like that. So uh, 2016 comes and at this point, I was like, okay, um, I was really into the Bernie Sanders. 
uh, during the 2016 election. And that's kind of what woke me up is like, hey, there's this person. He's speaking what he wants to speak. He's he's not really like an egocentric guy. He's just kind of an old guy that just kind of says it as it is. And I was impressed by it. Um, and then he got cheated uh, by the DNC and Hillary Clinton. And all of a sudden he talked with Pre President Barack Obama. And he came out because he was going into the whole thing. He's like, even even um, if I'm behind, I'm going to contest during the, the Democratic convention. And then he talks with Barack Obama and then all of a sudden he comes out and says, I support Hillary Clinton and I'm going to keep supporting her as her, and she's going to be the DNC nominee. And was, I was like, what? Why? I thought you were going to mm -hmm. contest it. And so at that point, I was I was waking up to just like it's now in your face. The corruption is in everyone's faces. It's out there. I mean, it's hard to avoid it. You'd have to really be so cognitive dissonant, so brainwashed, so hypnotized that you can't see it. It just, they would openly just tell you lies, uh, do tell you anything, cheat, uh, just do things openly. And they'll not, not only would they get away with it, they'll go to prison and it'd be like for six months in this nice little prison. They're out. It's like a child molester right child molester nine months you're out it's like what mm -hmm, right this isn't justice i mean if it was anyone else they'd be in prison for life and so you know that's just it's uh it was just layers upon layers of layers of things where finally i realized okay it's peeling back so many layers and, you know it's not like i'm building upon myself i'm just tearing away the 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 unessentials. It's kind of like how uh, um, Bruce Lee would talk about sculpting. You know, you don't add in stuff uh, to make a sculpture. You you just tear away all the unessentials, right. and that's and what lies underneath is is what comes out. Right. And so that's the whole thing. Um, eventually, I tried ayahuasca. That experience, uh, meeting mother, uh, kind of being humbled, seeing. Every, Everyone goes through it. Everyone feels that same pain that she bears. Uh, you meet her the first time you try it. And uh, every time you take it, I've only taken it twice, you get this less. you get lesson from her. First time you know who you are. You know why you're there. You know that there, the things that are, you see the signs. Like during that whole process, going up to it where I was going to take that experience, there were signs that I had in my head that I didn't know were signs because I would buy fresh fruit and certain things. And I didn't even read into it more uh, before that. I would read afterwards and saying you'd want something like oranges or lemons or whatever and fresh fruit and all this other stuff. Is like, it was just something that I was preparing for and, and I got at the store or all this other stuff. And then I took it and it's like there was a reason why I had to get those things. Like she, like something new that I was preparing to do this and was getting me ready for it. Because if I wasn't ready for it, I think I would have just had like the worst type of hangover thing, experience, whatever it was. And so I came out of that, the first experience and I was like, I am all powerful. I know who I am and all this other stuff. But the thing is, the second time I took it was a very negative, horrible experience. It was, it was not a, like, it was just a very humbling experience. Because all that power and ego and whatever you have, it's it's for a reason. It's not for you to just flaunt it, right? And so that was a lesson. It was just be humble and, uh, you know, to, to be humble, you really have to apologize for your past mistakes to other people, even if they were in the wrong and you weren't. You just kind of have to go out there and say, you know what, I'm sorry. And I would call up people call up people I've never talked to, didn't want to talk to, you know, never heard from for a long time, even my father and my aunts and whatever. And, and I did it. I had made the attempt and I, I feel better for it. I'm glad. And, you know, there's still more of that process maybe that I have to make, but it definitely changes my, my, per, changed my perspective. And I don't, when I see, when I recognize signs, like, I pay attention to them. I don't just throw it out. Like, for example, Compass, and we're going to get to this later. 
It's like, I'd rather just make a video or play video games or read a book. And, and all I, all I think about is a compass. It's like, why am I thinking about compass so much? Cause you know, all, cause I've, I figured, okay, I'm, I'm focusing on the North Pole, and I know com- all compasses point north, but why? what's with the compass? And then I go, compass. Is it maybe, like, why would they name it compass and name it sound like come and come and pass? Like, if you, the Latin translation for come is, is, is like, um, together, and then Latin for uh, pass or passos is something like step or pace. It's just like pace together or step together. But where would you step to? And it's like, say who invented the, the compass? Like, you're the first person to invent the compass. Like, you, you have this needle that points in one direction all the time. You know, no matter, no matter where you're moving, you're turning, it's pointing in that same direction. And you're going, what's in that direction? So you look at the sky, right, during the daytime, you don't really see anything uh, that where the, the needle is pointing. And then at the night, you look, if you're, if you're up in the, in the northern hemisphere, you'll see... It's Polaris. It's pointing right. to the North Star. And so once you figure that out, it was like daytime. Well, what comes on the on the very like 90 degrees from it, it's going to be the sun. Mo- most likely, you know, give or take a few degrees, where, depending on where you're living. But, uh, you know, sun rises on the east, uh, sun sets on the west. But no one's ever going to say, um, like, if it, it, it didn't, it doesn't point south for any reason. Not magnetically. And there's no fixed point. So if it did point south, you how would you know where it's pointing to? Right. There's no fixed point in the stars. The sun or the moon or the whatever doesn't rise or set from south all the time. So there's something definitely interesting with the compass, the name, why it points north all the time. Mm-hmm. And the reason, just the reason that they would name it like that is just interesting and something that like it doesn't get out of my head very much, and so I just focus on that thing, things with the magnetic North Pole, how like so the flat Earth, at that point was okay. There's the truthers that I I'd listen to, and um, they keep talking about flat Earth, and I was like, you know, I've always like. I didn't really care about what people thought of me. So I was just like, okay, let's look into flat earth. Cause I mean, I've went down almost every rabbit hole. There's so many rabbit holes. And, um, and what's funny is the mainstream media went, cause like I can debunk NASA, how NASA fakes everything. And, you know, moon landings were fake. And what's funny is mainstream media, every time they go, Oh, he, he thinks uh, NASA and the moon landing was a hoax. What what's next? He's gonna be be a flat earther. And I was like, why do they keep yeah. saying that? You know, they always say that. It's like, why do they always say that? But it's true. Right. <laughs> Once you debunk uh, NASA and know that the moon landings were faked and it's all a hoax, you become a flat earther. I'm sorry, people. That if if that's and if you want to keep looking, you're researching, finally researching the flat Earth. <laughs> you're gonna become a flat earther. It's just funny. It's hilarious mm-hmm. in some way. It's just. Um, did you see the Apollo 11 uh, where they tried to create the illusion that the Earth was a globe by using the window? Yeah, yeah, I saw yeah. that. That, that was, was one of the ones. Yeah, because, I mean, if the Earth is a ball, why do you have to fake it? And then if you're mm-hmm. faking it, how can anything that you say be of any kind of credibility? You know, because mm-hmm. if they're going to lie and hoax that, what else are they lying and hoaxing? Yeah, I mean, the moon is such a desolate place, right? Even if you look at it with your bare eyes or through a telescope, it's a bare, mm-hmm. it's just very, just looks looks like lifeless. It's 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 not beautiful at all. But when you when you see Earth or how you would imagine Earth being pictured from the moon, it should be beautiful. Mm-hmm. With land, the sea, the clouds, and even if you look at the CGI pictures, it's beautiful. Or right. you look at pictures in the hot air balloon, it's beautiful. You look. At mountaintops, it's beautiful. Anywhere you're on Earth, it's beautiful, right? right? You would think, like me, I would I'd start taking pictures everywhere. But uh, going to the moon, you would think they would take pictures from the moon to on Earth, about on Earth, right? Take pictures of Earth from the moon, or heading going towards right. the Earth or going away from Earth, just take pictures upon pictures. Twenty four hour now, live stream. Yeah, multiple, and, you know. Exactly. And, and you know, we have the International Space Station that orbits the Earth. What do we see every time 
they live stream. <laughs> they're doing tricks. They have right. astronauts doing tricks in, in what they say is zero gravity. Right, right. I mean, they're not doing anything scientific, anything worthwhile. We're giving them millions of dollars a day, yet anytime they're doing a live feed within the International Space Station, they're just talking or doing some tricks. It's like, that's not what we really care for them to do, right? It's It was cool the first time, but give us something tangible right. give us something run some experience i could give off 10 very cool experience to do in zero gravity they don't do it at all right. um they don't even accept like um people just hey why don't you why don't people in the world give us ideas to do in inside the international space station in zero g they don't even do that mm -hmm. um so when we get to the north magnetic north pole we have all these videos on the moon. In the moon, that's at, what two hundred sixteen thousand miles away. Um, yeah, we have to go through all these things that they say uh, radiation belt, and you know we have, they have to have just just perfect uh, telemetry data to get there. Of course, that could be done on on something that's that that was less powerful than the art like a smartphone from like 10 years ago mm -hmm. and um all this stuff and you know they land on it six out of six times they kind of rover they're you know they're driving around right. on it um yet zero videos of magnetic north pole zero and mm -hmm. it's not hundreds of thousands of miles away you know it's, it's no more than like three thousand miles away from most places and Nothing. We could go through the harshest things, weirdest things in space, yet we can't get to the magnetic north pole just to see what it's like. You think that would be an important thing? And and when I research it more, they say the magnetic north pole is weak magnetically. Uh, that the that the place in Florida they created like in 1999 uh, something that was a million, two million times more powerful than Earth's magnetic uh, pole. Two million times. But, of course, we never see these weird fluctuations of a compass just starting to point towards, like, Florida. We always still point, mm -hmm. see it pointing north, even though the magnetic north pole isn't as strong as what they say they just created. So it's just, um, like, all these fluctuations of the magnetic north pole, how it's moving, I don't believe that. Um, would they say how weak the magnetic north pole is? I don't believe that. Um, I mean... Even if it's that weak, it should be somewhat strong. And I would say, like, what if there's just something like that magnetic force accumulated different types of metals, like ancient metals even? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it benefit people, like archaeological explorers or something, to go there to see if anything accumulated within this mag magnetic area, any type of metal? And especially, like, uh, like say, just, um, like, swords from way back in, in like, like 200 BC, like a Gladius or something like that. It's like you could sell that on eBay for like a million bucks. And that expedition probably cost like 15000 Why don't people go and just try it and check it out? Right. Yeah, it says that, you know, the even though the iron um, pins and nails in the boats would be attracted to the, uh, to the Magnetic Mountain, to the Rupus Negra. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know. If it's that strong, who knows what kind of stuff is drawn to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, yeah, so I, I just think there's there's a lot there. They're hiding it for us for a reason. Like, the most important stuff, they, they don't hide. I mean, the most important stuff, they hide. The stuff that they just kind of want to, like, a misdirection, they show you and say, hey, don't go here. We don't want you to go here. But, you know, this is what's there. <laughs> Right, mm -hmm. magnet North Pole, nothing, nothing's there. You don't even right. want to go there because nothing's there, and it's dangerous. It's super dangerous. Yet a lot of re accounts and reports is that it doesn't really get super cold. It actually gets warmer, and it get, right. and and it stays brighter longer, right? Rather than it 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 being darker because you you'd be moving further away from the uh, equator where where the sun's at, mm -hmm. would expose more. So it just feels like there's an anomaly there. And um, it's it's worth investigating. And the thing is, is 
it has to take a certain person. Um, like, you have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to be dedicated. Go go there all the way, or don't go at all, or don't even think about going. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of people who reached that that are doing what they're doing. This is why I like when new people wake up and um, people who are awake. They keep doing what they're doing because then we find we eventually find people. Like I found. Uh, you, I found Mark Sargent, I found a lot of different people who've, who've woken up and just kept going. It's like there's, it's such a great resource we could go and talk to to them, email or call and just kind of just get the information, you know, rather than just them taking a blue pill and going back to just their nine to five jobs and right. whatnot. But then there's also people who have to either pick up that mantle or and the, the people who've been doing their research and, and making all those videos, they go and do what they wanted to do and explore further. Or there's the new people who wake up, they either do the same thing or they are going to have to go even further because eventually we're all going to have to, someone's going to have to act. Someone's going right. to have to take over all the things that they're lying about and actually do like the experiments, go and do the explorations. The go, old war explorers, you know. Yeah, so chasing and, down the Amazon River and stuff. Exactly, and um, so we're getting to that point, and it's just going to be incredible once more people wake up and want something to do. And um, I'm one of those ones like I just can't sit and just keep reading all the time. I just have to go and find things out for myself. Mm -hmm. Which we'll go into that. Um, but it reminds me of, like, you know, the different people that were exploring and looking for El Dorado and all these different ancient cities and all these megalithic structures hidden by the jungles and, you know, megalithic temple complexes. And now there's all this underwater archaeology taking places uh, for places like Yanaguni. And uh, supposedly there in Cuba, there's these huge megalithic temple complexes uh, at the bottom of the ocean and you know there's all kind of stuff I, I believe that there's more stuff that we haven't discovered than has been discovered and that there's just so much of it but um, but yeah I do agree that you know we need people to just go and check it out and to to push it and to let us know and so um, you are planning uh, a mm -hmm. trip to the north and, yep. and to the Arctic region. And so can you talk about that and how and, you know, uh, why it is you want to do it and also uh, how, um, you know, how you foresee being able to accomplish that? Well, it's not going to be easy from well, certainly not, at yeah. any point. Um, so I w I'm doing it alone. And I think there's a good reason for it because I have a, one of my lifelong friends since I was a kid. Wants to, even he doesn't agree with me on anything. Uh, he just wants to be there, right? But I can't allow that because first, the 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 path there and probably even the path back is is super dangerous. Right. But also when we're there, I think from the the like I'm not there to seek out treasure. <laughs> Right to to become a millionaire. Like if I wanted to become a millionaire, I just keep having a you know a high salary job, start right. investing, and all yeah. this other stuff. It's like I can get to that point. Why do I need to take a dangerous journey? Right. So the dangerous this journey is to get go there. If I can make it in and experience it and get information, pictures, videos out and show people, and it's like all it takes is that to get out to everyone, and it's it's almost game over. It's like uh, flat Earth right. plus right. this is what's at the magnetic North Pole. It's it's just a big double whammy. And then um, if I don't get very far, even if I get pictures and video of it, where like whether it's a mountain or the or some lands where it's just you would think it's just glaciers, but it's not. It's just it's like a almost like a paradise like what what they say it's like mm -hmm. that right there well, even from far away it's like i don't even have to get get in there i just have to zoom in my uh, my camera and then um uh so that's just worth it as well but the thing is there's also there's so many 
uh, like life is weird, but I haven't gotten to the weird part yet. Is that the accounts that you where he goes? They always say you have to be a child or at least to have the mind of a child to pass. And those that go and and don't turn back, don't fear anything. Like you can't be afraid because you're just gonna turn back. And the reason most people turn back. They encounter a dragon or some big serpent form of some kind. And most people see it and they go, I'm out of here. And they go away. But the ones who just encounter it and go, you know, I don't fear it. Uh, it's it's either they know it's illusion or that uh, there's someone with them that's going to protect them. And it turns out to be an illusion. So it's just weird. Like for me now, if I encounter a dragon first, I'm going to take a picture of it in the video. <laughs> And then, and then it's like, run. <laughs> yeah, either I run or it's like, it's all true. This is all true. So if it's probably an illusion, so I'm going to keep going or, you know, that's when I die or maybe it's like, you know, I try to devise something, whether to see if it is an illusion or something like that. Maybe I'll make like a decoy. And so if the decoy is safe then i i'd figure okay most likely i'll be safe or i'll just sneak sneak behind if i can or something who knows i don't know what to expect at the right. magnet pole. that's that's the problem but just to make that attempt is what we need more people more chances of success and i think the more people who go at the same time the worst uh, the least amount of success there is because if i was someone i i truly um have a friendship for I'm not going to leave them behind. Like if if they're if they get injured, I'm not going to leave them. I'm going to take them back. So there goes the entire journey. If I get to that point where I see that paradise, I see that dragon or whatever it is, they're not going to want to pass through and I'm not going to have them wait for me as I go through and they're going to have to go back alone, right? I mean, because they're not in it to to go all the way. They're in it for me and I don't want it. I don't want that responsibility. That's why I think going alone is the best way because you don't have the excuses to turn back. I mean, there's plenty of reasons I don't want to go because I have family. I have, I have like a five-year-old daughter and like a, a one and a half-year-old son. So I'm planning on this to try to be quick or plan it in a couple of years. Uh, where I have more information, where I could be more ready, where like right now I'm not the most physically fit that I've ever been. So maybe I can spend time to do that. Um, and maybe um, if I work at it, I save enough money to buy like a like a small, small boat, a small. I mean, like one of the accounts they were in a fishing sloop. I mean, that's pretty small sailboat right, right. there. Right. Uh, and they and that's almost better to navigate because they say that there's just a lot of ice flows out there. So rather right. than breaking through, you can just kind of navigate in and around some of those areas. So it's um the my my mindset is there. That's my goal. That's my journey that I'm preparing for. And if more people want to to make that attempt on their own and do the same thing take cameras take uh video uh equipment and go a certain way and then come back i think that's just a lot of stuff that just can just get more people motivated to go and once we find out what's there it's it's just it's almost a, it's a new world it's a new territory because people want to explore that's why people love space i love space the the lie the space my favorite genre is science fiction like space opera star wars gattaca was of it like futurama even the cartoon firefly the the show and uh, like i did a whole video is i love this stuff yet i'm a flat earther why would i want to do be that but it's not really about the space it's just about me ex exploration exploration is what really drives most of humanity is we want to explore we want to create we want to make make things different make things better you know no one comes into life saying hey, you know i want to make things worse how can i make things worse in life you know that's just that's all i want to do <laughs> almost no one does that especially a kid you know right so it's just uh we got to get back that motivation as a species um and just a lot, that mindset is just a good mindset. It's a positive mindset, in my opinion. And um, I think it's good for people because a lot of people just kind of 
repeat the same cycle every day for months, for years, and they don't do anything new. They don't get out of their comfort zone. They don't see a purpose in life. I mean, is the purpose in life to just make money, retire, and have a high high view of of from people that they know? You know, it's like mm-hmm. like is that is that it? Just if, if that's it, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm like no, it's it's not it. It'd be too much of a disappointment. I mean, even the whole evolutionary stage thing, which I don't agree with. I mean, uh, like they say, dinosaurs have been around for hundreds of millions of years. And some of the scientists go, you know, some some of them evolved to birds. Like our chicken was probably a dinosaur. So so what they're telling us is that if humans, if we've been around for hundreds of thousands of years, not even hundreds of millions, that after hundreds of millions of years, we're going to evolve into some flying creature that we're like uh, a tenth the size of. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you consider they they say we evolved of monkeys or apes, and yet the monkeys and apes are still with us, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and where's the whole missing link? And why have, haven't they changed into humans? Yeah. But, you know, with regard to, like, kids, you know, when I was with my friends, we used to always love just going out into the woods you know just exploring the woods and climbing trees and topping the next mountain and just seeing what's on the other side you know there's that inquisitiveness that uh, wanting to explore and look at and check out the world around us and and I think that especially with our having to reconsider a lot of what we thought we knew of the reality, um, and especially with the North, since all the mythologies, the Mount of the Congregation, and uh, you know the Eden land around that area, and there being a, an entrance even into the interior of the Earth, which I do believe that's an in interior. Uh, the interior is where Sheol is, but still, you know, the smoking god, the what you were talking about, how they took a uh, a small sloop and were able to enter into and found a benevolent race of giants. I mean, who knows, you know, but just the whole idea of ex- exploration. And then also um, with regard to the ancient cultures and civilizations, um, the mythology with regard to the Atlanteans and the Asgardians and the Hyperboreans are that these particular people lived in the north and that that is the origin of culture high culture and high society that it had its roots and its foundations that paradise was found at the north pole william warren um you know baptist minister wrote a whole book about this and talked about you know all the mythologies from around the world that spoke about these people that lived there in the north and how they had just far surpassing um, our technology, our culture, our civilization, that really instead of being at the height of civilization now, that we are really at the the lowest point and the most degradation as far as the collapse of what was. and. Um, being lost and split off and separated from what was that the old ancient cultures where they had just incredible knowledge and high technology and greater capacity than you know we can even do now i mean just the fact that you look at the kind of buildings we built and even i don't know if you started looking into the whole tartaria uh The, yeah, I've got one across Tartaria. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole Tartarian empire and civilization and all that and the free energy devices and the things connected to that civilization. And that was just wiped out a couple hundred years ago, you know? I mean, yeah. Ah, and just, and, and just to, to add in with William Warren, what people don't know, William F. Warren, he wasn't just that, but he was also um, the first president of Boston University. So a lot of people go, you know, credentials matter, you know, you can't just listen to some guy on the internet. 
This guy was the first president of the University of Boston, and not just for a little time, 30 years. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anyone out there that has credentials like William F. Warren. Right, so right. You want to talk trash about, like, uh, the ancient stuff doesn't matter. This guy spent his lifetime on it, and he was a president of one of the most prestigious colleges in the, in the world, you know, not just the United States. I mean, Boston University, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of people go to, I mean, Massachusetts has so many colleges, and Boston University is a big one. And so, right. yeah, it's just, I just like to add that in there too, because, uh, like, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, we're all people's, I think a lot of flat earthers just get excited when someone with like some pedigree kind of uh, joins the club and stuff like that. But that really doesn't matter. But if it has to impress people to wake people up, you know, we, we got to, I think that's one good, a good reason for it. Cause I mean, it's like, Hey, what, what's your credentials? You only have a high school de degree. Yeah, but the stuff that I'm looking at was written by a person who is the president of the Boston University for 30 years. What are your credentials? Mm -hmm. you know, so. right. Well, you know, with regard to credentials and you know, PhD and diplomas and degrees and all that, in my opinion, that just shows the level of your indoctrination and your brainwashing into supporting the, the whole system and the matrix of illusion that has been established to keep us ignorant and dumbed down and separated from what is real and what is sacred and what is uh, truth. And so, you know, I don't, I don't have any great respect. I, you know, I have a college degree, but as far as PhDs and all that, I'm, I don't give any more respect to people that have those kind of letters and those kind of degrees and those kind of things behind their name. Uh, in my opinion, it just shows that they're more a slave to the system than most people are. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of questions I want to ask you if we've got time for it. Um, yeah, sure. We've got um, some time, so go ahead. Like, um, so, in, in the, what, what do you think, like, I would say the reason that the governments and media and whoever just hides the um the magnetic north pole from us um do you think they they know exactly what's there do you think they have access to it free access or do you think it's like um they just they can't access it and they don't want anyone else to access it like what do you think is just the um the degree of involvement with with the the controllers who who don't want us to know what's at the magnetic north pole i think there's two levels to it. I think that one is that there's a spiritual component to it and that, you know, people that have ill intent or that are, um, you know, like New World Order elites that perhaps there's a spiritual barrier that, you know, especially for the whole thing of um, entrance into paradise. Like even in the Bible, it talks about how the two cherubim were put into place with this flaming sword guard to keep people away from the tree of life. But that, um, you know, the entrance into Sheol, uh, that that would be a different thing. But I do believe that there's a spiritual component to it, almost like, you know, what we see with um, the Wonder Woman and that island, mm -hmm. how there was that, that kind of facade, that illusion, that kept the outside world from knowing what was there. Um, but I do believe that, you know, the ancient explorers in, in like the Inventio Fortunata, that particular book, and also in John Dee's letter and the Mercator map, it talks about this large magnetic mountain, the Rupus Negra, being at the center of the Earth plane, and that there was this huge whirlpool there that was an entrance into the hollow earth and that it drank the waters of the oceans and then every um, every six hours would reverse course and then would spit and spew the waters out and that was what created high and low tide mm -hmm. and so you know and then in the mythologies like for instance with um, Virgil and the Aeneid and Jason and Argonauts and also Odysseus and the Iliad, it speaks about them encountering this 
whirlpool, which they believed it was a sea monster called Sharbatus. But still, when you understand the the intricacies and the detail of what we're dealing with with regard to the real cosmology, then that is what uh, connects to what these ancient mythologies are actually alluding to. And so I do believe that people can go and visit and see as the ancient explorers did because they did encounter these kind of things. And so, um, how, you know, whether there's some kind of spiritual component that keeps people out or protects these areas from, but still random people have come across shared in their experiences and their testimonies as to having encountered these areas. Um, and then there's, in, you know, interesting manuscripts like the Colburn Bible, which speak about this particular area, especially in uh, a text called the Scroll of Thothis, which I cover in great detail um, in a show you can find on YouTube, the Scroll of Thothis, T-H-O-T-H-I-S. Uh, and it speaks about the, you know, the giants and the cyclops and these different people living in around that area. And it speaks about that also in the mythologies of Odysseus, you know, how he and his men encountered this cyclops and were caught in his cave for a long time until they were able to trick him and take out his eye and um, allow, you know, they climbed on the belly of the sheep to get out of there. But those kind of things are found in the mythologies. They're also found in the ancient maps and in the ancient testimonies. And so I do believe that we can experience and check out and see the same kind of things if we were able to get up to and travel in and around and, um, and search out those kind of areas. And, and for those who, who, who say, you know, it's just all a myth, you know, the thing is, is a lot of those stories are shared across different civilizations from thousands of years ago. I mean, right. is it just coincidence they came with the same story, the same, same objects, the same types of uh, the things that they would encounter on their journey, which is, I mean, the names might change, but the, but the, their encounters have always been the same. Right. So it's just uh, that's something to also think into. It's yeah. just like, is that just coincidence that many civilizations no, would just come up with the no same thing? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. So it, it's always just you have to kind of have a little bit of, uh, you know, remain skeptical. But I mean, like, yeah, what are the odds? A confirming witness, you know, they're confirming yeah. witnesses, and the Bible says that out of the mouths of two or three witnesses shall the truth be established. And so I do believe that in looking at, examining, uh, especially the ancient maps, uh, the commentary, and then looking at the ancient explorers and the testimonies that they've shared. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I wrote the book, Paradise Sides of the North and the Mouth of the Congregation, where I share and explain all these things from not only the biblical perspective and the legends, for instance, of the Jews and the rabbinical commentaries, but also of like, the um, the Vedic cosmology, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the fifth canto, it goes into great detail as to this particular area. Uh, Bhumandala, it speaks about, same as in Eden in Genesis chapter 3, this four quadrants divided by the four rivers and all joining together and to be funneled by this indrawing sea. And that this indrawing sea Every six hours, it will reverse course and spew out the waters of the ocean. And, you know, it creates the tides, the high and the low tides. And so, yeah, I absolutely believe that these kind of things are there and can be witnessed if somebody can get there to check them out. Yeah. And that's where I'm just using the, the swastika a lot because I think that might have been a representation of... of of the the black the, sun yeah yeah the interior sun because they've got they've got them everywhere every civilization has that symbol right and it's not like someone said hey that's an interesting symbol that they have let's make our own version of it right. just, 
there's a reason for it. And um, right. And even so. though you know most people associate the swastika with the Nazis and with the Fourth Reich and the the Holocaust and the decimation of the Jews, it was an ancient symbol before they ever started to use it. Yeah. And it was a reference to uh, this hollow sun, this interior sun called the Smoky God in that particular work. Um, you know, that the two fishermen that went down there and speak about this and that actually came out in the South Pole, which in, in my opinion shows that there's a connection uh, between the North and the South within the interior of the Earth. But, um, but that... You know, I think also that the the um, Aboreas borealis, uh, the borealis, the aurora borealis, that it has connections to this particular phenomena as well. Yeah. And then you have like you know the ancient stories, journey to the center of the earth, uh, that in similarity talks about some of this stuff. Now. Another thing to that I wanted to ask you is, uh, and of course I kind of have an answer from from speaking to you on the phone before this, is the what's what's there? Is it evil? Is it good? Is it both? Is it like what what is it to expect? Like if if there is something imprisoned there, which um says please free me like do i free it or do i keep it imprisoned like but you know it, i guess it's all up to the judgment at that point but then it's so hard because you know the the evil seems to always lie in the shadows lie and whatever so i mean maybe it's just for me just to observe and not make any action right but still am i encountering demons angels god devil whatever is the demiurge what like there's, everyone has so many different opinions. If we do get there, what's there to encounter? Is it going to be paradise? Is it going to be hell? Uh, well, like, yeah. And according to the ancient mythologies, in my opinion on the subject, is that paradise we will only be able to go to after we leave our bodies. That there, there is most certainly a spiritual protection on gaining access and entrance to paradise. And like I said, the flaming cherubim are put into place to protect the tree of life. And paradise is above the vaulted dome of the earth. It's said to be in the third heaven. And you, you can't go there in the physical, uh, that only after death and only if you are worthy. But Sheol, on the other hand, the hollow earth entrance, the abysmal chasm, what is described as the bottomless pit, the angel of the bottomless pit, Apollyon and Abaddon, which means the destroyer, that is Satan, the demiurge, also called Saklas and Samael, the angel or the viper of God. Uh, he's in the Targum in chapter 3, Samael is the name of the angel, the feathered serpent, which beguiles Eve and impregnates her with Cain. And Cain is the firstborn son of the devil. And he is the progenitor of the wicked bloodlines, the devil's children here upon the earth. And also in the mythologies it describes in Isaiah chapter 13, and also the cave of treasures in the book of the bee, that the giants are imprisoned in the interior of the earth and the locust army and that these supernatural deities will be released at the end of days in order to bring the wrath of God and judgment upon those not written into the books of life. And so, in my opinion, these, uh, even though in the smoky God, it presents them as being, you know, the giants that were encountered were benevolent and did not in any way want to harm uh, the two individuals that went down into the interior of the earth. Um, it is said, and it historically has been, tied that the giants are cannibals and that they eat the flesh and drink the blood of humanity and that's one of the reasons why God when he restored Noah and his family and brought the flood on to wipe out the giants because that's what the flood was brought on the world for was to decimate the giants and not humanity 
uh, it says in the second book of Baruch that 409,000 giants were killed by the flood, uh, and it was specifically to wipe out the cannibalism and the blood drinking that was going on during that time. And Noah was given a new covenant that, you know, before then they were vegetarians, but he said that they could eat the meat so long as it did not have the blood within it. Mm -hmm. And so that was a new covenant that was established with Noah. And so in my opinion, if you go into the interior of the earth, you're going to, you know, you're going to meet with the devils and the demons, but that the North pole itself is Jacob's ladder. And there is a portal both that the higher angels and the lower angels legion are both using them and have access to that area. And so you could encounter both a uh, good angel or bad. And I think a lot has to do with your intent, but certainly pray yourself up before going in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, we got one more minute, brother. Okay, sure. Um, I guess is if, if I found the access easy, like, the, the entire journey that everyone says is saying it's difficult, that it's really not difficult. Do you think you would take that journey? I would not go into the interior. As far as going around the North Pole and around that area, mm -hmm. uh, certainly I would check that out and explore it, and I'd love to see it. Um, just make sure you're not being, you're not on a boat when the indrawing <laughs> sea is, you know, yeah. sucking in all the oceans of the world and, yeah. draining into the interior but yeah i think it would be a fascinating place to explore and you know there's also said to be there um a lot of creatures and you know um, beings that are, are not that we don't have access to and so who knows what you would meet there and i think that if you are um in relationship and aligned with the most high god that he will protect you no matter where you go but you know, again, that all depends on your intent. Yeah. Thanks for all the, all the information and wisdom. And, and you know, uh, it's it's just, it's really difficult because there's no one else really <laughs> to talk to about the Zen. Yeah. You know, that? it's like, you can't talk to, there's, I mean, if there is a profession out there, they don't really relate to the public. It's probably private study. I'm pretty sure there's right someone out there. Or a couple of people or organizations right that studies things like this, but...